read the book of Hebrews, I think you will profit a great deal from the, more from the discussions of this book if you are familiar once again with its contents. Now tonight, uh, I ask you to turn again to the first chapter of the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 6. Hebrews 1 and verse 6. Hebrews 1, reading at verse 6. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But to the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Now you come over to Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 1. Hebrews 3, 1. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. Now, will you come down to verse 14? For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. And one more verse found toward the end of the epistle in chapter 12 and verse 28. Turn over briefly to chapter 12 and verse 28. Hebrews 12, 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Now come back to Hebrews chapter 1. One Friday last October, police officer Robert Parrish of Trenton, New Jersey, responded to a silent alarm at the T and N Tavern. Going along with him on this call was Mac, his off-duty companion and his on-duty partner. Mac, however, was only two years old, which is not too surprising considering that Mac was a member of the Trenton K-9 unit. He was a black and tan German shepherd. When they arrived at the tavern, Robert Parrish took Mac inside for an inspection of the premises, and Mac led him to a doorway to the cellar, which was closed but not locked. They went down together into the cellar, but as Parrish reached for the light switch to turn the lights on, suddenly a knife-wielding 17-year-old teenager leaped out from behind a partition. Instantly, Mac was on his arm, but was slashed for his trouble. Mac hardly knew he had been hit, and uh, he moved in again for a second attack. By this time, Parrish had been able to draw his gun, and he disarmed uh, the young teenager. But Mac was seriously hurt. He was rushed to an animal hospital, and there on an operating table, Mac died while his partner embraced him with his blue uniform soaked in blood. Later, with his voice breaking frequently, Robert Parrish told police, in my opinion, Mac died so that I would get a chance. The sergeant who was in charge of the K-9 unit explained that Mac and the police officer were very close they lived together in everything, he said. And then he added, if it hadn't been the dog, it would have been the officer. If it hadn't been the dog, 
it would have been uh, the officer. Now that's a very touching story, and I suspect that every dog lover in my audience tonight knows exactly how Robert Parrish felt when Mac died. But whether it's a story about a man and his dog, or about two friends, or about two brothers, one of the most beautiful themes, one of the most lovely subjects in all of human life and experience is the subject of partnership, companionship, and loyalty. And tonight, I would like to confront you with what I really believe is one of the most exciting truths in the entire New Testament. And the truth is this, that you and I are invited into partnership with the Son of God. You and I are invited into partnership with the Son of God. Now please notice what I did not say. I did not say that we are invited into the family of God. And I did not say that we are invited to possess eternal life. Of course, it is wonderfully true that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And Jesus, as we learned this morning, when he came into the world by himself, purged our sins so that by one simple act of trust and faith in him we could possess eternal life. We can be members of the family of God, and we can be perfectly and completely sure that we will live forever with God. But I'm not talking about that tonight. I am talking about partnership and companionship with Jesus Christ, God's Son. Now I suspect that every parent in my audience tonight will admit that one of your main concerns for your children is their companions. And particularly when your children reach teenage, you are very concerned that they have the right kind of companions, the kind who will not lead them astray, who will be good for them. And there is probably not a parent living who has not at some time or other wished that they could choose their children's companions. And it makes sense that when God the Father chooses companions for his Son, that he would wish to choose the best possible companions that he could find. And maybe we might suspect that in choosing companions for his Son, God would choose the angels. After all, where could God find better companions for his son than in the angels? But here is a surprise. Here is a surprise. The angels are not the companions of Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 8, the writer reminds us that when God brings his firstborn back into the world, when Jesus returns in power and in glory, all of the angels of God will worship him. And we are informed that they are the servants of God. He makes his angels winds, and his ministers, his servants, a flame of fire. The angels worship and serve. But there is a great gulf fixed between the role of the angels and the role of the Son. For while the angels worship and serve, the Son rules forever and forever. And in verse 8, drawing upon the lovely, lovely words of Psalm 45, the writer brings before us the very words of God to his Son. God speaking to Jesus Christ and saying, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. 
what splendid words. What amazing words. God speaking to Jesus Christ and calling him God, promising to him a throne that will last forever, putting in his hands a scepter with which he shall rule righteously. That is truly amazing. You know, one of the most beautiful pieces of music that has ever come from the heart and mind of man, it seems to me, is that oratorio which we know as Handel's Messiah. And the most famous part of Handel's Messiah is undoubtedly the Hallelujah Chorus. And so noble and so majestic is the Hallelujah Chorus that audiences rise to their feet when it begins to be played. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! The Lord God omnipotent reigneth. And then in a series of descending notes, we hear the kingdoms of this world are become. And suddenly upward, the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And over and over again, the refrain, he shall reign forever and ever. And I'd like you to capture the vision of the future which the writer of Hebrews puts before us. There is the Son, and he is God, and he is sitting on a throne that is eternal, and he is ruling righteously, and he is surrounded by the angels 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, and they bow in adoring worship at his feet. They go forth from his throne to do his will like swift winds, like devouring fire. But mark it well. The angels are not his companions. And in verse 9, the writer continues with the words of Psalm 45, the words of God to his son. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. You see, this king is not only God, he is also a man. And when he was here on earth, he served God, his heavenly Father, perfectly. He loved righteousness perfectly. He hated lawlessness perfectly. And because of this, someday God will pour out upon him like fragrant ointment, the surpassing experience of joy. Therefore God, even thy God, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above your companions. But wait a minute. He's got companions in his joy. Oh yes, his joy is greater than the joy of his companions, and that's the way it ought to be. But he does have companions. You know, if you had been living in the ancient world, you would not have been surprised even a little bit to hear that a king should have companions. All kings in those days had companions. You remember that young man, Rehoboam, the son of Solomon? After the death of his father, he was about to ascend the throne, and he was waited on by a delegation from ten of the twelve tribes of Israel. And they said to Rehoboam, Look, your father Solomon was a tough king. He laid on us a heavy burden of labor and taxation. We would like you to relieve these burdens. And Rehoboam said, uh, Let me think about it a little bit. Come back in three days and I'll give you my answer. So the first thing Rehoboam did was to go to the old men who had advised his father Solomon. He said to them, what shall 
I give as an answer to these people? And the old men said, uh, we think it would be very wise of you to grant their request. If you will deal gently with them on this occasion, they will be your servants forever. But then Rehoboam went to the young men, and the Bible says he went to the young men who had grown up with him. These were his companions. These were the men who were educated with the king. They were the men who looked forward to the day when their friend the king would come to power because that would mean they would come to power too. They expected to be his inner circle. And Rehoboam said to these men, uh, what do you advise me to give as an answer to the people? And the young men said, uh, hang tough. Stand firm. Don't give an inch because if you give an inch, they'll take a mile. Tell them that your father was tough, but you're going to be tougher. Lay down the law to them. And that's what Rehoboam did. It wasn't good advice because it split the kingdom. But these were his companions. These were the individuals to whom he was closest. And he listened to them. And that was true of every king. Even in the Roman Empire, Caesar had his own circle of intimate friends who were called the friends of Caesar. And they were often appointed to high positions in the kingdom. It was normal for an ancient king to have partners and companions in his kingship. Now listen closely. The king about whom we are reading tonight does not find his partners among the angels. This king is a man, and his partners are men. To put it very simply, every born-again Christian is invited into partnership with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You say, Zane, how do you know that? How can you be sure? Well, I know this from what we read later in the book of Hebrews. A few moments ago, we read from Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, these words. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, and do you know that the word partakers in the original language is exactly the same word that we meet in Hebrews 1, 9 and is translated companions? And therefore, we could translate Hebrews 3, 1, Therefore, holy brethren, partners in the heavenly calling, companions in the heavenly calling. And in Hebrews chapter 12, at the very climax of the epistle, the writer says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, what? Are we receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken? Yes, we are. Why? Because Jesus Christ is receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. His throne is forever and ever, and because he is receiving that kingdom, so are we. Can there be any such thing as a Christian who listens to those words who is not moved to the depths of his being? To think of it, companions and partners with the king. Do you realize that in this auditorium tonight, there could be a couple hundred kings and queens. I don't know how to count an audience. Maybe 300, 400. Isn't that amazing? Partners of the king. Well, you say, Zane, what's the catch? There's got to be a catch somewhere. Well, I have to confess it. There is what might be described 
as a catch. And in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 14, we read these words. For we have become partakers of Christ. There that word is again. The word that is translated companions in Hebrews 1.9. For we have become companions, partners of Christ. If, if, if we hold fast the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. You see, as we were saying this morning, the book of Hebrews was written to Christians who were tempted to give up. They were tempted to stop going to church and stop assim assembling themselves together. They were tempted to turn their back on their Christian faith and on their commitment to God and Jesus Christ. And the writer of Hebrews says, please don't do that. Please don't do that. Because if you cast away your Christian confidence, you will be throwing away your partnership with the King. For we have become partners with Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. About two years ago, last January, Ronald Reagan had just been inaugurated and he was busy filling all of the positions in his new administration. And you know that during those days, I was not back in my apartment in Dallas, Texas, hovering over the telephone, waiting for a call from Washington inviting me to participate in the Reagan administration. Ronald Reagan doesn't know Zane Hodges from a hole in the wall. And even if he did, I don't think he would appoint me to anything because, you see, I've never worked for Ronald Reagan. Now, if you're talking about James Baker or Edwin Meese or Michael Deaver, or Bill Clark, then you're talking about people who have offices in the White House, who have positions of responsibility in the administration. And the reason they do is because they knew Ronald Reagan before he became president, and they worked for him. They worked for him. But I'll confess something else. When Reagan didn't call, I didn't shed any tears. <laughs> you know, if Reagan is elected next year, his administration will only last for eight years. And I'm just not interested in a position in a government that's only going to last eight years. You know what I'm interested in? I am interested in a kingdom that cannot be shaken. I am interested in a post in government that will go on and on and on forever. And you know what I hope? I hope that when Jesus Christ comes back in all of his power and glory and sets up his eternal throne on this earth, I hope he'll have a post in his government for Zane Hodges. But I'll admit something to you. I'm not absolutely sure about that. I'm not absolutely sure. Now, don't misunderstand me. <laughs> I am absolutely sure that I'm a Christian. I am absolutely sure that I possess eternal life, that I will live forever in the presence of Jesus Christ. But partnership with Jesus Christ is something you have to hold on to. I'm his partner right now. In fact, at this very moment, I am working for the future king right up here on this platform. But I've got to keep on working right to the end. You see, it was Jesus who said in Revelation chapter 2, He who overcomes... 
and keeps my works to the end. To him I will give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he shall shatter them as the vessels of a potter are shattered, even as I have received from my Father. The overcomer, says Jesus, will rule the nations like I rule them. And in Revelation chapter 3, Jesus said to him that overcomes, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, as I also overcame and have sat down with my Father in his throne. I am my Father's partner in his throne, and the victorious Christian will be my partner in mine. And it was Paul who said, if we endure, we shall also reign with him. And dear Christian friend tonight, if you are a Christian by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will always be a Christian. You will always possess eternal life. You can be absolutely sure of living forever with Jesus Christ. But partnership with the King is something that you have to hold on to. For we have become partakers, partners, companions of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our confidence firm to the end. There's a very lovely story about a young woman in the state of Maine who was in love with a sailor. And one night as she and her boyfriend were together and he was preparing to sail away the next day, she made a promise to him. She promised that every night while he was gone, until he returned, she would put a light in her window. The next morning, her sailor friend got on board his ship and sailed away and was never heard from again. And you know what that woman did? She put a light in her window every night for 50 years until the day she died. That's loyalty. That's commitment. And my Christian friends, our Lord Jesus Christ has left the world, but it's only temporary. His father has said to him, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And someday, he is coming back to set up his kingdom to triumph over his enemies. And his partners in that day will be those who have been faithful to him, who have kept his works to the end. Or to put it very simply, the partners of the king are those who have kept their lights burning. The songwriter was right when he wrote, Give me oil in my lamp. Keep me burning. Give me oil in my lamp, I pray. Give me oil in my lamp. Keep me burning. Keep me burning till the break of day. Christian friend, if your light is always burning for Jesus Christ, you will always be the partner of the King. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and with godly fear. Shall we pray? What can we say to thee, our Father, that you have called us into partnership with your glorious Son, we are staggered by the greatness of this invitation. And we come to thee seeking the grace that we need from your hand to continue steadfastly and to keep our lights burning for him. Help us to do this and to share 
in the power and authority and glory of his kingdom forever. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.